Today's speaker, Nicola Franceschi, uh, he will talk about the bottom-up reconstruction of DBs, Divisom uh, for synthetic cells. Uh, and Nicola is working in the International Institute of Molecular Mechanisms and Machines, IMO, and at the Polish Academy of Sciences. So welcome, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Thomas, and I would like to thank the organizer also for giving me the possibility to present my work here. Uh, so I'm going to share the screen now. And now, let's see, hopefully you can see the opening image. It is visible. Yeah. Okay, okay, good. So, um, today I'm going to present you the work that I've done as a postdoc at Delft University of Technology. Um, on bottom-up reconstitution of a divisome for synthetic cell. So this is not done at IMOL, or at least not, not entirely, uh, but IMOL is where I'm setting up my own lab uh, right now. So just a few words about uh, this, this, the concept behind this synthetic cell. Uh, my lab in Delft was part of a, a nationwide Dutch consortium uh, called the BASIC, uh, Building the Synthetic Cell. And the overall um, aim of this consortium is to build a fully autonomous synthetic cell starting by uh, building uh, different modules. One is genome duplication, the other is cell division, and then also metabolism. And then once these modules are uh, working, the idea is to integrate them into a, into a liposome, uh, obtain a fully autonomous synthetic cell. So I will go back to this, uh, to this topic at the end of the presentation, uh, but now we'll focus on the module that I was working on, which is cell division. And so cell division, uh, to achieve cell division in vitro, actually, uh, we need to uh, reconstitute two different processes with very different um, um, mechanistic, mechanic, mechanisms. So uh, when we have a cell, hopefully the, the genome has been divided in the synthetic cell. So what we need to do first is to uh, constrict, so deform the membrane so that we can get a constriction in the middle of the cell. This is the first process. And then the second process is to assemble some kind of scission machinery at the neck, now connecting these two, uh, these two daughter, daughter cells, because this scission will not happen spontaneously. We need a machine that catalyzes it. Um, so uh, to address the first aim, of obtaining uh, membrane constriction, um, I came up with a new system, uh, which, which I call synthetic membrane shape. And just to give you an idea of what needs to be done, uh, here I'm showing you a movie of a liposome. This liposome has been placed in condition of low membrane tension that allow reshaping. And so, as you can see, it is a very dynamic object. It's essentially shapeless. And this is also, uh, the membrane is liquid. So there is no particular anchor point where you can assemble a machine or anything like that. So in order to be able to shape this liposome, uh, the, the approach I came up with, the synthetic membrane shaper, is as follows. <clears throat> uh, the synthetic membrane shaper is, the, is in an, an ensemble of nanostars. And nanostars are small um, DNA assemblies. They're about 100 kilodalton in size. They're basically a holiday junction that bear uh, two cholesterol moieties uh, at the end of two arms. And when, when, when these two cholesterol uh, moieties encounter a membrane, they will anchor the nanostar to the membrane. And so what happens is that if you bind these nanostars on one side of the membrane only, so asymmetrically, uh, you will, you will, the effect will be that that particular leaflet will expand and the other one will not, and this will cause uh, uh, curvature. However, this will be applied to all the liposome in all its surface equally. And so you wouldn't expect much to happen, but in fact, because of the particular properties of liposome, what you get is exactly a uh, membrane deformation to obtain a dumbbell. So here you see the process uh, basically depicted. Um, when you have a liposome, you have the nanostars, and then uh, you, you, you place the membrane in condition of low membrane tension, the spontaneous deformation will lead to the formation of a dumbbell. And in fact, very often what you get is, is a chain of dumbbell because the process is actually very, very efficient. And so this act actually happens spontaneously to the membrane, but the addition of the synthetic membrane shaper makes it a lot more efficient. And I can actually show this uh, to you live. So this, what you see here is a, is a liposome uh, that is already being deformed and this is being captured live 
and you see I'm trying to follow here the liposome with the stage because it's moving, but you see that this, this tube uh, gradually becomes a chain of dumbbells. Okay, um, so not only with this system we can obtain these chains of dumbbell, you see here on the, on the right, and they look very similar to uh, biological structure that we can encounter, for instance, uh, Staphylococcus aureus bacteria. These bacteria, when they divide, they form chains that look a lot like what you get in vitro. Not only that, but with this, with this system, we can easily encapsulate macromolecules like proteins or DNA inside these dumbbells. And here you see an example on the right again, where I encapsulated purified DNA into these uh, synthetic membranes, obtaining something that looks a lot like a real bacterium with its own DNA. Um, okay, so this was the first step, membrane deformation. Now for the second step, uh, cell division, that is membrane scission. Uh, we took uh, inspiration from bacteria. Uh, for instance, in this movie here, you see this bacterium that is dividing, and you see this bright green uh, uh, ring, which is called that ring, that forms in the middle of the cell and gradually constricts and splits the cell. So this ring, called that ring, is actually... Um, uh, a complex of many, many proteins, um, but the main protein and the one that actually gives their name to the ring is FTSE. Uh, it functions as a scaffold and people also for many years thought that this will actually be the protein that mediates the final step of scission. So we thought that this was a nice place to start. And the idea was to create this dumbbell shape using the nanostars, the synthetic membrane shape, and then having FTSE assembling at the neck. And so when I encapsulated FTSZ with, with its membrane anchor zip A, I was pleased to see that indeed the protein localizes predominantly at the neck. And it was also able to induce some kind of deformation to the neck because you see now this is an elongated neck, which only you can only see when you have FTSZ. I can actually also show you a movie that uh, basically show you how, how the protein is really stably localized at this neck. However, we were not the first one to uh, assemble FTSE at the neck. Uh, this was done a couple of years earlier by uh, another lab, also in Tudelf, uh, the Danelon lab. And they were using a completely different strategy. In their case, they were uh, synthesizing FTSE inside the liposome. But the result was the same, as you see in the bottom image here. Uh, you have the purple FTSZ at the neck and then the, the membrane in green. What was clear in both cases is that FTSZ is not able to induce membrane scission. It nicely localizes the neck, it deforms the neck, but it doesn't induce division. And so uh, we started working with another protein, also of bacterial origin, uh, which is called dynamine A. So dynamin A, as you see in these uh, uh, upper images, co-localizes with FTSZ at division uh, sites, but not during cell division, during cell uh, sporulation. And in the bottom images, you can see uh, when dynamin A was removed from these cells, uh, this sporulation was far less efficient and there were uh, many abortive events. And so we, we, based on this, we hypothesized that dynamin A could be uh, responsible for the final step of membrane scission. Uh, also, based on an analogy of, uh, with, with the eukaryotic dynamine, which is also a membrane scission machinery. And so what I did, again, I encapsulated uh, dynamin A in the synthetic membrane shaper system. And again, I was pleased to see that dynamin A was able to localize spontaneously at the neck of the dumbbell uh, liposomes. In this case, you see there is no uh, elongation of the neck. And how to prove that this is actually, that the scission is actually happening. Uh, the way I did it was by uh, taking a dumbbell, uh, photo bleaching one of the two lobes and looking at the recovery. And so if there's no recovery, then you would conclude that scission has happened. If there is a recovery, then you conclude that scission didn't happen. And so here you see an example of an open neck. So a neck where you have assembly of dynamine, but scission did not happen. So you see here on the right, a very nice chain of dumbbells and dynamin A present at each neck. And I'm gonna bleach the upper neck, the upper lobe, and you're gonna see that this will recover very fast. So this is a clear example where the protein is there, 
but scission has not happened. Um, I also saw many examples of full scission. In this case, you see, uh, I'm gonna bleach the, the lower lobe here, and it doesn't matter how long you wait, the lipid will not recover. So we interpreted this kind of cases as, as a full scission. However, there was a, an unexpected uh, development because we have a third kind of result, which we didn't expect really, which is hemiscission. In this case, uh, the one of the two leaflet uh, have undergone scission, but the other one is still connecting the lobes. And so you see an example here, I bleach the upper lobe and the fluorescence comes back, but only about half of it. And, and so this is basically indicating that only one of the two leaflets um, is still connecting the lobes. And I think this is the first time that hemiscission in this particular kind of membrane geometry has been reported. Okay, so uh, the conclusion is that dynamin A triggers membrane hemiscission and also full scission. And here you see the quantification of the results. So without dynamin A, most of the necks were in open conformation, but then with dynamin A, about one third were fully, um, were in hemiscission state and about one third underwent full scission. And so uh, basically this is how uh, this works. Uh, you have dynamin A uh, binding to, to the neck and you know, bringing the two membranes together. At some point, hemiscission happens. And then there's a second step where the other leaflet fuses and you get full cell division. Uh, so what are the conclusions from this study? Um, certainly there's a positive side uh, because I think we have achieved uh, both constriction and division. So this will be one of the modules of this uh, master plan in the basic consortium, achieving cell division. Um, but so this is obviously positive, but then having done this, uh, one need to step back and take a look at the bigger picture. So there's another two modules that are missing and I'm sure they will be developed. Uh, but to me, in a way developing cell division didn't bring the final goal closer. In fact, I think it, it brought it more far away because I realized by doing this hands-on how, how strict the experimental conditions need to be in order for this module to work. And this approach requires that at the end, all these three modules will be somehow uh, uh, combined in one single synthetic cell. And then somehow, uh, cycle needs to be imposed on the synthetic cell and some kind of evolution needs to be imposed. And this is a general uh, approach in the synthetic cell field. But I'm honestly starting to question whether this is really the way to do it. And, and that's why I'm, following, I'm attending this conference because I think that in the origin of life field, the approach that is followed is in a way, uh, the opposite one. And it may, may be more sense because another problem on the synthetic cell field is that this, this, this kind of approach implies that we already know what it takes to build a synthetic cell. And I don't really think we do. On the contrast, in the origin of life field, uh, the idea is to start from prebiotic conditions, either plausible or not, and then often uh, the cyclic nature of life is already intrinsic in these conditions. And here I'm, I'm referring, for instance, to the work on membranes done by David Diemer and Jack Shostak. And then out of this system, one expects to, uh, to uh, the, the, the different modules will spontaneously arise. And to me, this is somehow more logical. And this is exactly what I'm planning to do in my lab that I'm now setting up in, in IMOL. Um, so here on the left, uh, you can see uh, all the people that have been uh, contributing to the work that I've just shown you. And I would like to thank them all and also the, the, the funding agency. And on the, on the right, uh, you see the future, which is my own lab in IMOL uh, called the Membrane Machine Lab. And IMOL is a new institution, uh, very dynamic, very international, and we're hiring, so we have project on, on synthetic cell, on membrane biophysics, also cell biology. So please uh, visit our website if you want to know more. Uh, so I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions.
Thank you very much. That that was a fascinating talk. Um, we have two questions on the chat. Um, the first question from Mikoe, and Mikoe, if uh, you would like to like rephrase it, uh, you, you, I can put you on the scene if you share your live uh, video and audio. But the short, if do you see the question on the side? Uh, uh, DNA. This is how to regulate where DNA will be moved. And then mm -hmm. there is a longer explanation. I'll give you a second mm -hmm. to read it. Yeah, no, no, that's a that's a good question. Of course, uh, this this pertains the module of uh, DNA duplication and segregation. Uh, in fact, uh, the problem that you are mentioning in this in this question is very relevant, and this is why one of the approach will be not to have one single DNA molecule that will be uh, duplicated, but having the the genome scattered in many different plasmids that will then basically segregate randomly. And if there, are, if there are many of them, then, you know, on average, you will expect more or less an equal uh, division, an equal distribution. Uh, because as you said, it can be, the DNA can get entangled in the neck and in cells, of course, there are uh, a lot of mechanisms to avoid this, which will be extremely difficult to reconstruct in vitro. So I guess, yes, the, the idea is to try to have many small plasmids that compose the genome, which happens in some organisms. Super cool. Okay, and what do you think could be the mechanism of localizing FTSZ and dynamin A to the neck? Because they spontaneously go there. What, what brings them there? Um, uh, well, the answer is very straightforward. It's based on the curvature, the intrinsic curvature of the, of the protein filaments that is being formed. So for FTSZ, this has been shown. FTSZ forms short filaments that are clearly curved. I've seen in AFM and many other, um, with many other techniques. So that wasn't that surprising. For dynamin A, it is a bit more surprising because um, we're not sure it really forms a polymer and we're not sure in which kind of geometry because that's inside the member neck. Mm -hmm. uh, it may be, it, it's somehow sensing the curvature, that's for sure. Exactly okay. how, mm, we don't know. Physics. All right, uh, Kate Adamala commented that it was an awesome talk and what is the constraint on the lipid composition? Are there any particular phospholipids or sterols required to the protein uh, to correctly assemble, or any uh, reasonable stable membrane will do it? Um, good, good question. Um, we have tried a few uh, a few different compositions. Uh, the membrane shaper seems to be completely insensitive to the kind of membrane that you use because it will insert the cholesterol uh, moiety in the membrane that will happen with any membrane. Although having cholesterol that can flip-flop uh, will somehow counteract the action of the shaper. So you wouldn't like to have cholesterol, hopefully. Uh, for the um, for the dynamic, you need some negatively charged lipids, which is not a problem. Uh, so in general, I would say the lipid composition is not is not a problem. You can you can change it. Um, the constraints are others are like the practical is the way you make this structure. I don't think this is compatible, for instance, with microfluidics or with another technique that you can use to to make cells and then take them and do something else. It's kind of a closed system, let's say. Okay, Kate, if you could unmute yourself and show your video, uh, comment if the question the answer was. <laughs> clear <laughs> and if yes let's move to your talk then and thank you nicola it was thank fascinating. you very much uh, have you lived in poland before or are you moving here for this project uh i'm married with a polish woman so <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> i know poland See you around <laughs> and i visit poland and plenty of people here on the conference live and work in warsaw so natural collaborations See you. Yeah. thank you